Welcome everyone. My name is Jeff Lamia. I'm president of the AIA New York Society. On behalf of the society, I'd like to welcome everyone tonight. Uh, for those of you who may be visiting for the first time or haven't heard this before, um, I wanna just briefly touch on the mission of the AIA and the New York Society, it's really the same. The mission is to foster the professional practice of archeology span and equally as important is outreach to the general public to inform the public about the latest discoveries in, in archaeology. With respect to the first, the fostering of the professional practice of archaeology, the New York Society, as I've mentioned in other venues, is actually quite active and we have a new program. Uh, we're now in our second year called our New York Society Scholars Program where we try to bring and support um, students of archeology, span undergrads who are uh, sophomores, juniors and seniors and first year graduate students by giving them a free a membership in the AIA. And if they wanted a, a subscription to archeology span magazine, to the American Journal of Archeology, span and importantly, to make them uh, the possible, open the possibility for them to receive a $1,500 fieldwork scholarship. And this year we have five new awardees. It's our second cohort and they are a diverse group from NYU, from Columbia, from the Institute for Fine Arts, Hunter, Barnard. So it's a, a diverse group, just like the previous year. So it's really a, a thanks to Joanne Spurza, who is, leads this committee in this effort uh, with respect to uh, these new scholars. And I believe to this evening we have with us, joining us, uh, Jasmine Smith, who is one of our new awardees and she's from NYU, from the Institute for Fine Arts. So welcome Jasmine. And I look forward to meeting you in person. Um, hopefully this will get over this COVID virus. What I'd like to do now just briefly is walk through some of the, um, the Archaeological Institute itself. There is a national lecture program and I'll, I'll mention that again. Um, obviously the AIA is the North America's largest and oldest archaeological organization with over 200,000 members. And as you can see, we support a whole array of people with excavations and publications, research it's, and site preservation. Obviously, Archaeology Magazine, which comes with subscribers, uh, with membership in the AIA, uh, reaches over 700,000 people or more for each individual issue. And as I mentioned earlier, we publish an academic journal called the American Journal of Archaeology. And this lecture program that the New York Society holds and the National Lecture Program is really part of the outreach to the general public. But I would also like you to call your attention uh, to the lower left, where there is an extensive list of fieldwork opportunities. So if someone is interested in participating in some form of fieldwork, you don't have to be a trained archaeologist. They take volunteers and there are varying periods of time and the registered um, opportunities are actually across the globe. So I urge people, if they're interested, to take a look. Again, um, it's part of uncovering the past, which is uncovering uh, really um, discovery, et cetera. And so in that regard, I would just say that the uh, AIA is a, a vibrant and a national organization uh, across the US and Canada. I would also like to um, call your attention to the fact that uh, we will have the New York Society itself will be having lectures starting in January right through April. And so I would urge people to those members to watch for your winter newsletter, which will have a listing of that. For others, I would say go to the website AIA-NYSociety.org where you'll see that. And also the uh, New York Society does uh, put out email blasts, email announcements for, for uh, various lectures. 
and we have a vibrant it's an interesting group covering climate change and and um, various other kinds of things both in the new world and the old with respect to the this tonight's lecture i just would mention that there will be time for q a after and there's a chat function in your screen the q a which you can type in your questions and we'll try and deal with them at the end of the lecture tonight's lecture we are fortunate to have dr sheldon skaggs who is an associate professor of chemistry at bronx community college which is part of the city university of new york system he specializes in geoarchaeology with a focus on ancient maya archaeology He's conducted extensive geophysical surveys um, in uh, the state of Georgia, but also importantly in Belize and Italy. He is field director of the ancient Maya archaeology project at the site, at a particular site of Pak Bitum in Belize, and mentored, and mentored many students in their research and excavations since 2013. Um, he's also the co-founder of a variety of advanced metal detecting uh, efforts, and there, he's also a member of the Registry of Professional Archaeologists, and uh, received a National Park Service Director's Partnership Award in 2018 for his work at Minuteman National Historical Park. He's received his BA, two in fact, from the University of Washington, one in anthropology and the other in chemistry. And after working in environmental chemistry for six years, he returned to archaeological science by earning a PhD in geology from the University of Georgia in 2010. Uh, published extensively, most recently on Maya archaeology, about which I'm sure he will uh, mention this evening. And his research focuses on isotopes of both the Maya and Roman archaeology projects. So with that, uh, I'll turn the podium over to Dr. Skaggs. Thank you very much, Jeff and the Society for having me. Uh, I will bring up my slides here. All right, so uh, I'm a chemist, I'm a bit of a physicist, but for I've always been an archeologist. And so uh, my interest was in how I could use chemistry and physics to understand ancient peoples better. So there is going to be uh, a little bit of science to go through at the beginning, but I promise when we get to the end, I will have some scientific visualizations of artifacts so that you don't feel like you completely missed out on archeology span of Pak Pitun in Belize. Um, so uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Terry Powis from Kennesaw State. Uh, he is the permit holder for the site. I'm the field director, so I'm the second in command. Uh, and the permit is uh, allowed by the government of Belize through the Institute of Archaeology. And so we are very grateful for them and our primary funder, which is the Alpha Wood Foundation in Chicago, for allowing us to do the Maya research in Belize. And uh, all archaeologists in the modern time now use isotope chemistry. They may not realize it, but it's even in the name of how we determine numerically how old archaeological sites are. If you've heard of carbon dating or carbon-14 dating in particular, uh, this is the uh, type of isotope chemistry that uh, many people think of when they first think of archaeological science. Basically, uh, We'll explain what isotopes are, but um, you absorb a certain amount of the radioactive isotope carbon every time you breathe, every time you eat something. That is decaying all the time in your body. So you, without replenishing that carbon-14, the amount of radioactive carbon-14 that's absorbed in your body would go down over time. And after something uh, dies or gets buried, uh, that's what happens. And so we can use that clock uh, using modern day carbon-14 levels in the atmosphere of uh, 1.35 trillion ordinary carbon atoms for each radioactive carbon atom. Uh, when that ratio gets smaller and smaller, less and less radioactive carbon, we can then use that as a clock to date how old uh, organic material in that uh, is 
uh, up to you know, 50, 60,000 years ago. So what are these magical things, isotopes that I've been talking about? I'm gonna go back a little bit, hopefully to high school chemistry, if you remember that. So I have up here uh, lithium, Li, that's the sign for lithium, just because it's a small atom and it looks nice when you, when you draw it out. Every atom is, contains three components. There are these red dots, which are electrons. These uh, are around the outside of an atom. The number of electrons is controlled by the number of protons. These are the blue balls in this atom configuration. These have positive charges to balance out the electrons. This is what makes an atom a one type of element. If you add more protons, you there get more electrons and that would make you a different element. So you can't change protons. You really, the, the electrons are general basic chemistry of acids and bases, and that's how that works with the electrons. There's one other component in atoms, and that's the little brown circles here with the N, and these are called neutrons. They don't have any charge, so they don't interact with protons. They don't interact with the electrons. They are simply in the uh, uh, atom providing a little bit more weight to those atoms. So that means you can take away neutrons or you can add neutrons to the atom without changing what that atom is. So I have three examples of lithium here. I have lithium that weighs a total of six because it has three protons and three neutrons. If I add one more neutron, I get lithium, which weighs seven. So we call it lithium seven that has four neutrons and three protons. Finally, I have lithium eight. This one has five neutrons and three protons. They are all lithium. Chemically, you would not be able to determine or do any chemistry that's different uh, from each other. So they're effectively the same lithium atom. The two on the right are just slightly heavier than the one on the left, which is probably the base uh, element. So why do we care? If they don't react, why do we care? Well, there is one way that you can tell the number of neutrons that are in an atom, and that's through the weight of the atom. And so it, uh, all chemical reactions also have a component of the weight uh, in that chemical reaction. So if you imagine if we were all in a room and I had a bunch of tennis balls, I could ask everyone in the room to pass a tennis ball around and we could pass them around infinitely and nobody would get tired. If I then change that to bowling balls, and I asked everyone to pass bowling balls around as fast as they could, I think pretty quickly we would all get tired and have to put those bowling balls down. This happens in chemical reactions where this lithium-6 here, the lighter lithium, is more easily able to uh, go through chemical reactions like evaporation or uh, metabolization when you eat something than the lithium-8. Now it's a very, very small difference in weight. So it's a very, very small difference in the chemistry, but there will be differences. If you have lithium-6 in your body, it will be at a different percentage than the lithium-8. And every chemical reaction that takes place will increase that difference because of the different weights of the different isotopes. And so that's how we're go I'm going to use isotopes to determine things about ancient people. So I'm not, radio, I'm not using the radioactive isotopes. I'm looking at the ones that are stable. They last a long time. And they're only slightly different in their weight. So now I've said I can weigh these atoms. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a brief intro on how we actually measure atoms. And this goes for the carbon-14 atoms. It also goes for the non-radioactive uh, atoms and isotopes that we work with. Again, they're heavy. Some are lighter, some are heavier. And so um, what we do is I have to take a bit of your artifact. I have to put it into solution or vaporize it with a laser. So everything I do is a destructive process, but it's only a tiny, tiny, tiny speck of your artifact that needs to be consumed. And what happens is I get it into my instrument in some form, a liquid or a gas. I get a charge on those atoms. 
Uh, and then I send those atoms through a magnet because any charged particle is going to curve when it comes into a magnetic field. And we divide, design these instruments so that the, the magnetic field curves the, ma the, the, sorry, the isotopes and separates them by their mass, just like a, a, a light car can take corners faster than a heavy car or a heavy bus. Heavy isotopes take these curves slower and they wind up being in the outer side of the path. Lighter isotopes take the shorter path. And then we put collectors where we know these different isotopes will wind up and they hit the back of the collector, create a little electrical signal. And then we use that to count, literally count the number of each type of isotope that we have in the sample. Again, not super exciting uh, in itself. It's neat science, but how do we use that in archaeology? All right, well, for my PhD in 2010, I was interested in looking at where a certain type of artifact metal was being mined. So where did the metal come from? My uh, artifact that I was interested in were lead curse tablets from Roman Tunisia, so North Africa. So here is Spain and France and Italy. I'm interested in North Africa right around here. And basically I wanna know, I have a material that's made out of lead. Where did that lead come from? Was it mined in Spain? Was it mined in England? Was it mined in Italy? Where did it come from? Well, one of the things about lead is all lead is derived, or almost all the, the isotopes of lead, other than native non-radioactive non lead, uh, is from two sources, uranium and thorium, breaking down over millions of years to form three different isotopes of lead. And then you have one isotope uh, that, that is naturally occurring lead that is a part of this radioactive decay process. And so over millions of years, the different rocks that make up the mountains and these lead deposits pick up different amounts of your lead from different uranium and thorium sources on the continent. And that's what I have. I have different chunks of rock here, uh, the Sahara uh, Atlas Mountains, the West Africa Craton, the Sierra Platform. These all have different lead isotope, what we call signatures. It means they have different isotope ratios to one another. And so then I can use that. And if you go to Spain or France or Italy, if somebody has taken samples of the lead ores from those areas and measured the isotopes very, very precisely, you can compare the metal in these lead artifacts to the metal sources from those areas. So here are some examples of what uh, cursed tablets or defecciones uh, look like. And these are interesting artifacts. They're uh, illegal in Rome, that's black magic. So the idea behind a defeccione is you're cursing somebody. So imagine somebody wasn't, uh, didn't want me to gain a reputation with the AIA. They wanted me to be a poor speaker and mess up this opportunity to impress everyone. They would write on a piece of lead, um, they would write a curse saying, I hope Dr. Skaggs' tongue ties up in his mouth and sticks to the roof of his mouth and he can't talk during his big presentation. And they might draw little images of that, like in the lower left corner here. Um, then they would roll this bit of lead up and they would deposit it in a deep well or in the grave of somebody who had died uh, horribly, and they would hope that that would then get to the gods of the underworld who would then come in and curse me, bind my tongue so that I couldn't speak. And we find these tablets in, you know, chariot races, uh, all sorts of different legal cases, all sorts of different scenarios where you might want someone to do bad. And they even have some what they call love curses, where you try and bind somebody's heart to your person so that they would fall in love with you. So that's the idea. These are illegal artifacts. So you're not going to order one of these from England or Spain or Italy or France and have it shipped to you. These are made locally. And that's one of the reasons I was interested in testing the lead in these 
uh, artifacts. They're pretty short term. It's, uh, you know, it's something that you want to happen tomorrow or the next day when you decide to make these or a week away, but it's not something you plan long term. So it's local and it's fairly short term. That means whatever lead you grab to make these tablets out of is lead that was there in Tunis. It's not something that was made somewhere else and then brought to Tunis during the Roman times. And over here, the other reason is UGA had some of these that had been collected previously from the museums for another project. And so they had these little bits of lead hanging around that we knew where they came from. And UGA also had some excavations in Tunisia. And so they had excavated some of these as well uh, before I started my PhD program. And so you always start with an artifact that you've, you have on hand if you can. Now, what didn't I have? I didn't have, and nobody had done, an extensive sampling of all of the lead ores that were in Tunisia. They've done it for England, they've done it for Spain, they've done it for Italy, but we didn't know, people assumed that nobody mined lead in the Roman period, and so nobody had gone around and collected all the lead ores. So I had nothing to compare it to. I could analyze all the artifacts I wanted, figure out how much lead 204 versus 206 or 207 or 208 were in these artifacts, but unless it came, that lead came from England or somewhere else, I wasn't sure that it didn't come from the local area. And so part of my PhD was to create this database so that everyone after this would be able to identify lead and silver because silver is actually, a, has a small amount of lead in it or it's mined from lead ores. So you could trace where lead and silver artifacts, if they happen to be from Tunisia, where they were in the world as well. So it was a two-part two uh, PhD project. And so what happened is I collected all of these lead ores, and they are some, this is a small chart, not to overwhelm you, of different geologic scenarios. So these um, green dots and uh, red triangles are lead ores from Tunisia. And if you look at the ratio, I've only got two of them up here, lead 207 versus 206. So you just divide the number that you had here by that number and you get these ratios down here. And in the y-axis, you have 208 divided by 206. And so you get two numbers. It creates a nice 2D chart. Now there's one other ratio you can form, which forms a three-dimensional chart, which I didn't feel like showing you guys. So what were my results? Well, if you look, I was able to determine that, yes, the lead here matches very well with this uh, Tunisian ores from this geologic deposit. Part of my PhD was also trying to figure out if there were other ways we could tell if these were local ores or if they were ores from other areas. And so I had been able to uh, pick these tablets in general and say, I think these come from Tunisia. And when I uh, check the isotopes, these ones did come from Tunisia. I tested a lot of other ones as well, and they came from different areas. And so I had a really nice sample here that I was able to conclude that uh, despite the common knowledge, wide held that there was only lead mining starting in the medieval times in Tunisia, the Romans actually did mine some lead from the local mines in Tunisia. I also found lead ores from other areas, primarily Sardinia. And we had a few sources that have not yet been sampled in the archeological database. So they could be extreme mixtures of a bunch of different leads or potentially leads from areas that haven't yet had a database created for those artifacts. All right. So how else do we use isotopes to determine things about ancient peoples? And particularly for people like the Maya who don't have metal artifacts. So I can't use my lead isotope uh, analysis to determine where lead artifacts came from in the Maya world because they don't have lead artifacts. Now there's lead everywhere. So it is possible to use lead isotopes to determine a few things about people. But primarily, when we're looking at isotopes, uh, we're looking at carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and strontium that you eat or drink and gets incorporated into your person over time. 
And we can use those to just like the artifacts, we can determine where you're from potentially, but also more interestingly, we can determine something about what you ate and what you drank in order to pick up the nitrogen and the carbon in your system. Okay. Strontium and oxygen, we, we look at those primarily in teeth and bones because your teeth, pretty much your molars are uh, developed when you're a baby and before you're even born. And so they pick up the oxygen and the strontium from where you were born. Your bones recycle every 10 years or so. And so if we compare the oxygen and strontium in your teeth compared to your bones, and we find a difference, that probably means that you moved from where you were born to a different location with different food and water sources to add to your bones, which get recycled. So how do these differences in carbon come about? Well, we look at carbon-14 to determine how, how long something's been dead. We can look at carbon-13 in your bones and in your teeth because different plants process carbon dioxide differently. It has to do with the number of times the carbon dioxide molecule is broken apart in the plants. I'm not gonna bore you with those details. But basically, we have three different pathways that plants take to photosynthesize carbon from the atmosphere. Trees, grass, certain grasses, rice and wheat use what we call the C3 pathway. Other grasses, sugar and maize for Maya, maize or corn is incredibly important. They use what we call the C4 pathway. And then cactuses and uh, uh, other types of desert plants use what they call the CAM pathway, which I'm not gonna worry about for this talk. But the effect is they all absorb a different amount of carbon-13 into the plant material. And when you eat that plant material, you get a different amount of carbon-13 in your body. And so if you look at this chart with the x-axis here, and this is the ratio of carbon-13, whether it's in what we call enriched or it's depleted, carbon, uh, sorry, C3 pathways are more carbon-13 depleted than C4 pathways. And so if you sample a bone and it comes up in this area, you can say, ah, that person was probably eating a lot of maize or sugar or other C4 plants. Now, again, this will, uh, it's a kind of a generalization, but it can be used uh, at least at a first blush to figure out what somebody was eating, what type of plants. We get most of our nitrogen from the protein, the, the, the meats that we eat. And so this is a Belize example. Uh, we do have some examples from Pac Bitoon, but we had this nice graph uh, from the report that I've referenced uh, down here. And so I figured I would use that. This is a database of the Belize or the Yucatan Peninsula area. And what they did is they took bones from deer and from turtles and iguana and ocean fish and, and uh, algae and all sorts of different sources and they figured out what the ratio of carbon was to figure out if it was primarily a C3 or a C4 plant pathway and the amount of nitrogen 15 enrichment in order to determine generally more C uh, faring animals have higher levels of uh, nitrogen 15. And so you can tell if something was um, ocean marine animal protein versus something that was more terrestrial protein. And especially it worked out very well here in on the Yucatan Peninsula. You can see there's big separation between the C4 plants with supplemental proteins from ocean fish compared to terrestrial fish. And so we'll come back to this chart here. I just want to remind everyone where the Yucatan Peninsula is here. So here's the United States and Mexico on the left. And I've kind of blown in uh, the area here, zoomed in on Belize. Uh, the study was looking at an island, Ambergris Key, up here on the upper right of this figure. Pac Bitoon is in the middle, so it's right near the mountains near the Guatemalan border. 
We'll look at both of these uh, in terms of this study on iso uh, carbon and nitrogen isotopes. So when they took the skeletons and they analyzed them for carbon and nitrogen isotopes, here's what they found. So those ones on ambergris key were right around this area in the upper right. San Pedro, Cac Blame, San Juan, and you can see they have high nitrogen values, nitrogen 15 values up here in the upper right. Pac Betoon, which is a landlock, we're 150 miles away from the coastline, is here in the centers in a little bit to, uh, you know, lower and to the left of the, the uh, island areas or the coastline of Belize. Now remember, corn is a big part of the Maya diet. This is not a surprise, hopefully. And that actually is what's centering these sites, Copan and some of these other ones, and Pac Betoon in this region of the carbon values. Now, the reason that we believe that Pac Betoon is higher in nitrogen 15 than a place like Copan is the fact that since its early beginnings at 600 BC, Pac, we found evidence that Pac Betoon had a shell bead production uh, workshops, for lack of a better word. And these are marine shell beads. We find them in part, you know, all different stages from the large shells that come straight from the ocean to the tiniest beads. And we find them in the hundreds of thousands of artifacts. We find the drills that they made the beads from. And we always had wondered, do they actually, are they getting just the shells or are they getting the meat with the shells? And are they getting other things? We find some fish bone uh, for like grouper and uh, other marine organisms. And unlike the Copan site here, it, we have a higher nitrogen 15 value at Pac Betoon, which does suggest that they were getting a significant amount of marine food it, rather than just the local uh, maize and local organisms deer diet for their meat. And so this is one of the ways that you can try and use isotopes to figure out what people ate and in what percentages. All right, now we also look when we're trying to source people we also look at the amount of oxygen isotopes, oxygen 18 versus oxygen 16, and strontium. So let's explain how oxygen 18 uh, changes as you go from water that evaporates off the ocean. As it gets blown, this water vapor gets blown inland, the clouds get blown inland, and as it rains, those oxygens get depleted in oxygen 18 as you move further and further inland until when you in, are in the interior of the country, there's quite a bit of difference in oxygen 18 that is in the water compared to near the coast. So rainwater with its oxygen 18 can help us determine how far from the coastline or what water source a particular community is using because it'll show up in their bones or for the, if you've lived there all your life, it'll show up in your teeth. Additionally, as this water moves through the, the geology, the rocks in the area, what's in those rocks will dissolve in the water and eventually get into the plants or get into you directly when you drink the water. And strontium is an atom about the same size as calcium. And so when there's strontium in the rocks, a small bit of that strontium actually winds up being incorporated into your teeth and your bones as you grow. And this study, uh, they went around the Yucatan Peninsula sampling all sorts of different areas to compare the different isotopes of strontium that were in the groundwater uh, and in the rocks, the geology of these areas. And so now you can use the strontium levels, you can see there's a small amount of difference between the different clusters, 
the geologic clusters in the area, sort of like there was in the lead isotopes in the geology of different areas for the same general reasons. The rocks have different amounts of strontium of different isotopes in them. And that gets into the bones. And then when you look at the individuals that are in graves and you measure their teeth and you measure their bones for strontium and oxygen, you can then determine sometimes if they were local or if they were foreign. And so the red bars here with the little whiskers at the top and the bottom is kind of the where the average individual at Shunantanich, Belize, that's where the usual graves fall into in terms of strontium. And you can do a similar thing with the oxygen isotope levels. But now how about these two circles up here at the top? They're significantly different than the rest of the individuals in that community. That suggests that these outlier people are probably foreigners. And if you do, if you have enough sample and you have enough of the skeleton left and you can tell the difference between the teeth and the bone and the bones preserved well enough, you can then say, well, did these foreigners come here right after they were born or within the last 10 years of their life? So those are some interesting questions that you can then start to ask from isotopes. Ideally, we would like to use these isotope values to start tracking where individuals are moving around, where they were born, where they died and were buried across the landscape, along with what types of food and um, what other items, of course, were traded in these regions, because that then allows us to start determining migration of people and trade patterns throughout the Maya region. All right, now while there's lots of variabilities in preservation, in diet, in microclimates, you're able to determine some differences in food and water consumption and show migration of individuals using isotopes. This is but a small fraction of the types of science that can be done to source artifacts, to source individuals. So there's another big thing in Maya archeology span that has been in the news since about 2013. And so it's moving from chemistry now and isotopes. I'd like to move into physics, the physics of light. You may have heard of something called LIDAR. It stands for light detection and ranging. Basically what happens is we know because of physics how laser beams uh, travel, how quickly they travel to a target and how quickly they travel back from a target. And so if you have a GPS enabled plane and a GPS ground station, you can tell exactly where this laser beam is and it can shoot out thousands of laser pulses that hit areas on the ground. And the idea is you can time how long each laser pulse takes to get back to the plane. And that tells you how high the plane is above where that laser bounced off of something. So this is great in open fields, right? You can tell exactly where the surface of the ground or the buildings are because the laser beams will paint where their elevations are, and then you can use 3D models to figure out what they look like. But how about in desert, or sorry, in a uh, jungle? This is, the, this is why it's become uh, so incredibly important in Maya archeology is because 90% of our sites are in jungles. And so the idea is you're shooting, you know, 100 laser pulses for every square meter of ground that you're covering. And so yes, some of the pulses coming in are gonna reflect off the top of the trees. And if you look at this chart here, you can see a lot, some of the pulses are reflected at this elevation. Some of those pulses are gonna make it further into the trees and then bounce off of uh, limbs and uh, leaves that are deeper in the trees or on trees that are lower down, but still not the ground surface. And when those beams come back, they'll create intensity patterns of reflected beams at these elevations. But every now and then a laser will hit, miss, sorry, all the trees, all the limbs, and it will hit the ground. And when it returns, 
this will be the lowest returning uh, laser pulse, the one that is furthest away from the airplane, the, the least elevation of all these laser pulses. And so that's great. You can use this for tree studies because you can map the tops of the trees and the middle of the trees and the smaller trees. But what's really good is I can come in and I can just cut out all of the laser pulses that returned at these elevations. And what I have is I now have the ground surface with as if I'd come in and I had used a lawnmower to chew up and remove all of the vegetation. This is incredibly important for Maya sites. So here is a site, uh, Tikal. Uh, you've seen it before if you've watched Star Wars A New Hope. This is the uh, rebel base on Yavin. You saw the X-Wings come in and they filmed it on location here. You saw the X-Wings come in and land near these big temples that are in Tikal, Guatemala. It's a very famous site. I, I thoroughly, uh, after you've come and visited Pac Bitun, you can go right over the border about 15 miles to get to the border and another 50 miles to get to Tikal and you can tour Tikal as well. You'll be impressed. But from satellite photos, look at all of this vegetation. You can't, you know, you can see a couple of the temples, but you can't see what's going on in the outside area. So once you take a plane over this area and you you do the LIDAR and you filter out all of the, the vegetation hits and only look at the ground surface hits, this is the type of three-dimensional map you create. Now you can see the contour lines, but they can also, the color represents elevations. So these are the reconstructed temples here in the center, okay? But even those, we've stripped all the trees off. And so you can also visualize and map these out very well. The, the ones that, yes, they knew about them for Tikal, but they haven't excavated and reconstructed them are these more soft, mushy looking mounds here. But you, from the LIDAR, you can map them out and know exactly where they are very well. You have exact GPS points. You've got some interesting terrain and features that were built over here on the left, upper left. The center, you can see a, um, a sock bay or a, a basically a area, a, a little highway running out of the site. You, with this LIDAR, you can strip away the jungle and actually see the archeology span that is impossible to see on the ground. And so Belize has done this as well for many areas. We were lucky at Pac Bitun to have some of this data. So just to remind you, Belize, the Yucatan Peninsula, here's where Pac Pitun is right on the border. Here's the Belize River Valley. And we are quite a ways near the mountains off of this major river valley. And our site is like many others. Uh, it is, you know, about five or 10,000 people at its uh, peak at about 900 AD. So 600 BC to 900 AD, it starts from a small village here in Plaza B, uh, making marine shell beads by the hundreds of thousands to a full blown uh, kingdom of its own, probably underneath somebody else, perhaps later on. Uh, but they build, what you're seeing in this map is the last things that they built. And the way these little maps work, just in case you're wondering is, this is a, the tallest area of this structure and it slopes away on all sides from the little square in the center of building two on Plaza A. The next photo is going, you're gonna be standing right where the A in Plaza A is looking towards structure two to the west. This is what it looks like. Now, this is the only building that we have reconstructed in part. It was reconstructed a little bit. So if you come to Pac Bitun, it's a very, what it looks like before archeologists reconstruct it. So it's a kind of a nice site for that as well. And I'm bringing it up because the artifacts, the artifact or maybe artifacts I'm going to show you uh, is, um, will be from the south end of Pac Bitun. So let me just, go back here. So we're talking about this area in the southwest corner. It's a series of three courtyards, which are sunken areas with buildings all around them. And I wanted to show you what LIDAR actually looks like. So this bottom portion here with the red bar going across is a, a contour map based off of the LIDAR points. It's uh, contoured at about 25 centimeters. 
So a foot, it's a foot contour lines. That's why you've got all of these really tight uh, uh, circles instead of the usual contours that you're used to looking at. Here's what the LIDAR returns. So if you start on the west of this red bar and you go to the east, you're starting on the west. All the trees and everything that's normally here, we've, we've just come along and pulled them all away and only left the bottom most uh, returns. And that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing the buildings. So you come up to a steep side of a building and then you have a courtyard inside and then you come up to the building that I'm gonna show you a picture of, which is I'll be, you'll see me standing on the side of this building in excavations right here. Structure 29 is what we call it. And then you have two more courtyards. So there's me standing on that slope. It looks a lot worse when I'm standing on it. And then we're cutting through the building, uh, an alleyway between two buildings through here. So I've worked on these palace courtyards. This is where the royal family probably lived based on what we found in these uh, courtyard areas in terms of artifacts. And I'm gonna focus on these excavations right here in the, the southwestmost courtyard in the center of the courtyard. I was just trying to put in some excavation units to figure out how old the courtyard was and how many different uh, construction episodes there were. But I wound up uh, spending all summer excavating that courtyard because we found eight burials and a bunch of artifacts. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to show you one of these artifacts. And sorry, here is the, the, the grave that it came from. I'm just showing you the top stones on these graves. They're kissed or cyst burials, so they're covered with stones. And this burial right here was the one that the artifact I'm going to show you was located in. All right, so here is some, a picture just so you have an idea of what it is. This artifact was broken apart. It was scattered throughout the grave and it is made, I, I love it. I'm a geologist, so I love this artifact because this artifact was made of marble. It's not ceramic. It looks like white ceramic. It's a carved sculpture. A Lua Valley marble vase, or at least most of a marble vase, as you can see here. And from the style, you can tell it's from the Alua Valley, which is in Honduras, so a good 300 miles away or so. It's a very elite artifact in that there are only a, a less than 200 of these that have been discovered in the Maya region. And so we we're trying to figure out why or how this artifact got to Pac Bitum. And so that's why we're now looking at the, the isotopes of the individuals in these graves. And that research is ongoing because I would love to be able to prove through the isotopes of their teeth and skeletons that they're not locals to Pac Bitum and that they brought this vase with them from Honduras when, when they traveled here. But we'll see how that, that research goes. Um, but what I would like to show you is just like LIDAR is using physics-based light to map things, I can actually take all the photos that we took of this marble vase and I can use what we know about light. I can have the computer figure out the angle the camera took the, the picture from and I can, it, it will figure out the, tr you know, the light rays going in and, and bouncing off and where they, they were to create a three-dimensional image that I can move around for you and uh, show you this piece of a Lua Valley marble vase. We can't remove it from Belize. Uh, Belize retains all of its artifacts. Uh, we can only remove sp small pieces. So I was able to take a little bit of dust from this uh, marble vase and I was able to compare it to the database of carbon and oxygen isotopes, marbles made out of carbon and oxygen. And that we were able to do not only stylistically is it from Honduras, but I've actually traced the, using the isotopes, traced this vase back to the quarry that in Honduras that the marble was mined from. And so that's why I include it. But I also wanna show you photogrammetry, which is this using light and how light rays bounce off of objects to figure out and create artifacts that I can then show you in presentations like this rather than showing you photos. And that you'll be able to go to the website and be able to manipulate this artifact on your own. If we were in person, I would be able to pass out 3D printed on white plastic 
copies of this artifact. Unfortunately, during COVID, we can't do that. So you'll have to settle for just this three-dimensional representation. So I'm gonna stop sharing for just a second here to bring up this program right here. So it looks like a photograph, right? Well, I'm gonna grab it and I'm gonna move it around, okay? So this is not a photograph. This is a compilation of 40 or, or uh, photographs per side that has been recreated into a 3D model of this artifact. So it wasn't quite perfect as I can show you on the end here. You can actually see inside the model right there. Okay, so it is a, a computer construction. And again, at the end of the talk, I have a slide where you, it has the website where you guys can come in to the website and you can come in and, and look at any bit of this model at any zoomed uh, resolution that you would like. So this is a uh, really nice artifact. We are hope, hopefully going to be putting more artifacts up on our website for the, the public to share so that uh, everybody can learn from these and also do research on them. Okay, so let me go back to my uh, talk here real quick. All right. All right, well, I may have got stuck. All right. So pretty much that's my talk in a nutshell. I know it looks like I'm pretty close to the end of time. Um, I would love to take questions about isotopes, about LIDAR, about the, the vase, or about photogrammetry in general. So Sheldon, we have one question in here that came in earlier. Uh, I think it's a typo, but um, uh, I was gone early on. Uh, is what is an isotope? Could you could you please uh, re-explain that quickly? Sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I, again, this is high school chemistry, so some mm -hmm. people have it, some people don't. But an isotope is simply atom, an atom that has a different number of neutrons in it. So it's an atom like any other atom of carbon or of oxygen that is slightly heavier than ordinary oxygen. And all elements have isotopes. So carbon-14 is a, a carbon atom that has two extra neutrons in it. Carbon-12 is the, what, 99.9% .9 of all carbon is, but occasionally there's a carbon with two extra neutrons, and that's why it's radioactive. And similarly, uh, my lead, there are four different isotopes that I work with with lead. Um, with strontium, there's strontium-87 and strontium-86. So they just have a little bit of extra material. It doesn't affect the chemistry in any way other than the weight. You can determine the weight of each individual atom to be different. And so you can use that to determine things about where the material came from or um, you know, what a person ate or things like that. Thanks. I have a question myself here, uh, and I'm anticipating what your answer is, uh, because your uh, your slideshow just uh, got stuck at the end there. But this uh, this lovely uh, marble vase is that up on Sketchfab? Or yes, it is on Sketchfab. Sketchfab. Um, okay, but um, uh, let me. I'm going to try. If if not, uh, there we go. It's working now. Let me go ahead and share again my screen just so that I can get that last slide. Uh, let me see, there we go. So you can, I actually have our website, packbetoonarchaeology.com slash multimedia, or if you have a QR code, you can just take a picture of that. You can actually go right into our site and it, it's, uh, it's linked to the Sketchfab link. So on our website, you can actually turn that artifact around on your own and zoom in and zoom out. So can you see the, the uh, website address? Yeah, I see it and I just scanned the link. So I've got it open on my phone now, thank you. All right, yeah, it works on phones. I love having, I'll have on my posters 
3D models of all the artifacts that I want to bring just stuck right on my poster. But also I'll have these QR codes so anybody can go in and take a you know, take that code and play with it on their phone while I'm talking to them about that particular thing. Perfect. I'll just uh, add for our uh, attendees right now is that uh, we, we are recording this session. So if you miss this, uh, this URL, if you miss this QR code, you're going to have an opportunity later once we post the video that you can get it again. Uh, yes. There is another question here from April Burkhall. It says, what okay. was the vessel in the marble used for? So what was that marble vessel's purpose? Uh, great. It is, uh, we are working on that in that we, uh, some, some of the other things I, I, my colleagues do is they do what we call food residue analysis. So they actually are able to scrape a little bit of the interior of the vase off at different points. And they are able to sample what food potentially were, were in that material. So these are um, ritual vases. They probably were involved with a uh, chocolate drink. So chocolate in the Maya culture is ritual, it's important. Um, it's for the elites. And so you probably um, use this to, to have a celebratory or uh, religious ceremony where you take a big drink because it actually has two handles on either side that we have didn't recover. Um, that would have been carved like jaguars and you would pick it up by both handles and then you could dip the drink, uh, you know, take a big drink, pass it around or however they would use it. And so we're looking at the, the residues for the traces of chocolate. And my colleagues are very good at finding chocolate. And so uh, that research is coming out. I can't say anything other than we did find food residues and uh, we know what was in that vase and, and hopefully publication within the year that everyone will know it was in the vase. Great. So this is a, a known, a known vessel type. Yeah, the, there, again, there aren't many of them, but we believe that they were used as um, prestige trade goods and ritual, you know, for, for the nobility. It's, it what didn't surprise us that, that, that this would be found in our courtyards because of the other things we find, we believe these are royal burials or sacrifices to the royal burials. Um, we found uh, some atlatl finger loops, which are pretty rare to find. They were carved out of conch shell. Uh, we found all sorts of pottery that we don't find anywhere else. It's very fancy pottery. Um, and just the isolated nature of these courtyards suggests that they were um, important for the elite individuals. Thank you. So uh, another follow-up question here. Uh, so the chocolate mug was pretty special, huh? <laughs> Yeah, um, yes, these, like I said, it's uh, uh, under 200 are in collections around the world. Well, that's pretty fascinating that you, uh, you found one. And uh, is, is marble frequently used material for these or are they? they yes, these ceramic? are always, it, it's it, in uh, the Ulua Valley, it's one of the things they're famous for. One for their floral pattern, you know, these swirls, like they say, they're, they're the wind coming out of caves. And they have little faces here. If I go back uh, to sharing my thing, I can show you one of the faces. Let's see if I can do that. Uh, yeah, so if we come in, I can turn this. Let's see, I have to remember how to control. Okay, so if I come in, you can see this gentleman's nose in the center and two eyes, and then there's a little mouth with teeth. Below it, he's got these little swirls that are like supposed to be uh, wind coming out of caves. Um, let's see, can I, if we look over, you may wonder how I know it's a jaguar handle. You can actually see the feet of the jaguar here and the handle would come off of the uh, left side here. But there, the marble is that there have been white stone carved vases after um, this, you know, these started getting traded to the Maya region and that became uh, kind of a thing to do, but there are only 200 of them that are in ex this style and also uh, obviously isotopically sourced to the, the Alua Valley. Great. I have another uh, long question here for you. Um... <laughs> <laughs> with sure. a few different parts, but it's from Joe Shepard. It says, one application of the lead and isotope analysis could be to help provide information about unprovenanced antiquities, perhaps, especially yeah. those that might be suspected of being forgeries. So if you could answer that, and then I'll go to the other half of the question. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, particularly um, with like paints now for, you know, paints in, um, uh, you know, masterpieces, for instance, if the lead comes from a source that was not mined or used by other masters in the Middle Ages, then that can't have come from the Middle Ages. Um, it can be used on silver coins because, as I said, silver is usually um, obtained not as pure silver, but silver with other minerals that contain lead. And some of that lead remains with the silver artifacts or the silver coins. And it's been very successfully used to track you know, where silver objects come from. Um, additionally, I can track where uh, you know, um, people are based. If I can get a database of the lead in the groundwater, we can use lead isotopes in order to trace you know, in the bone uh, where people come from or where pottery comes from. If there's a small trace, trace amount of lead in the artifact. In fact, I, I did all of my analysis at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. They were scared to death of my samples. Their instruments are really expensive. Uh, that's one of the reasons archeological science is hard to do is because it's hundreds of dollars per carbon-14 analysis or per lead isotope analysis. But that's because it's the geologists that are testing for strontium in rocks or lead in rocks. And they, they're using the lead to track granite around. And they're talking about just you know, microscopic amounts of lead that they want to be able to detect very precisely. And here I come in with a 100% lead object. And I come into a lab that is a clean room. So it's literally, they have to keep the dust in the rest of the building out of this lab so that they don't pick up the background signature of North Carolina in their samples from all over the world. So they, they were scared even if I had like a Q-tip with a little bit of acid that I scraped across one of my artifacts. That was like thousands of times more lead than they were used to dealing with. And so when I went in and analyzed, you know, separated and analyzed my samples, we had to dilute, 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 dilute those samples before I could bring them into the area to do the purification and analysis that is done. Second part. The second part, actually, you kind of anticipated there. Okay. Uh, so the second part of Joe Shepard's question is, are there reference data available for the Mediterranean against which museums can compare their samples? Is there an out of the box cost effective and user friendly <laughs> way of collecting samples? Or is it only possible for specialists or big labs to get these samples? Well, Luckily, yes, everyone shares their lead isotope data. That was part of my PhD is I created the lead isotope database for Tunisia. People have done it for all over the Mediterranean, certain areas like Morocco or Iran or uh, other areas maybe aren't sampled as well, but we have some samples from those. Getting the samples is the easy part, even though I spent you know, all my Christmas break traipsing around the mountains of Tunisia, looking for these lead ores. Um, that was the easy part. I had those in hand for a long time. The hard part is finding the money in order. And I had an in-student discount rate and it was still $150 a sample. And I was running those myself. So I'm a kibbis. I was going in, they trained me how to do it. And I was doing all of my own separations and running the instruments. It would be $300 a sample if somebody else had to run them. And so that's one of the difficulties of isotope analysis is that it is expensive. It's one of the reasons that we obviously encourage donations from wealthier individuals with an interest in this to all archeological projects so that they do have the money to do. Carbon-14 is the same way. Carbon-14 is a, you know, it's a 200 to $600 a sample, but it is the way to figure out how old something is. I'm going to jump in and- sure. uh, say to Dr. Skaggs, thank you very much. Uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Greatly appreciated you to take the time to, to give us a, some basic background about the chemistry and the physics, and then obviously how it affects things archeologically. Before we leave, I would just say to everybody, please watch we, our website, or if you're a member, uh, the winter newsletter, you'll see all of our um, forthcoming lectures, and please join us in the future. Again, Dr. Skaggs, thank you very much.
Thank you. It was a pleasure.